It's beautiful, stirring, and it may have some rethinking their definitions of art. Flower, coming to the PlayStation Network this Thursday, is set to become the leading argument for games as art. These are typical exclamations following internet presentations of that game company's new game Flower, released on February the 12th this year. Let's uh, have a look at it. By removing many of the barriers associated with traditional game distribution, digital downloads offer the promise of more diverse offerings. Flower is such a game. Created by the development team behind the quirky flow, Flower is unusual in that it's less a game or an experience. You don't necessarily play Flower, you interact with it. It's beautiful, stirring, and it may have some rethinking their definitions of art. Flower opens with a view from inside an apartment overlooking a dreary city. Potted flowers appear on the windowsill and serve as the gateway to six worlds, each viewed from the perspective of a particular panel. While there's no text, narrative, or cutscene explaining what you're supposed to do or why you're doing it, as you progress, you reflect on the environment and how it's easy to overlook or to take for granted nature's inherent beauty. Fortunately, your pedal has metal. Flower's design can best be described as relaxed. There are no points to track, no time constraints, and no right or wrong way to play. Your goal is simply to touch groups of flower buds, triggering them to bloom, which unlocks other areas of the world. In essence, you are the equivalent of E.T.'s floating index finger. Finally, the exit on each stage sends you back to your apartment window, with a new flower pot on the windowsill serving as a portal to another world. Um, both developers and critics describe Flower as a game with special aesthetic qualities. Its artistry is on the one hand explained through the game's lack of explicit, explicit instructions and score systems, on the other hand through its abstract and dreamlike story. A third argument for Flower bringing computer games closer to art preaches its delicate graphics and their ability to arouse the player's emotions. There is no doubt that text instructions and score numbers can be annoying in the screen picture of a game striving for pure visual expression. Thus letting graphics and soundtrack themselves lead you through the game is a sophisticated and intelligent way to solve this problem. But would this be possible if this game had a more complicated plot? What is sacri sacrificed on behalf of its sophistication? The players are hardly given any challenges. You are actually invited as you heard, to relax when playing this game. Is this what a gamer really wants? And more important, does it bring computer games any closer to art? I interpret the arguments for Flower's unique artistry as based on an outdated understanding of aesthetics, an understanding concerned with beauty and harmony. Abandoning scores and replacing instructions with interactive forms and sounds is definitely an elegant move, but as an argument for artistry, it signalizes that a game gets more artistic, the less game-like it appears. And that is to undermine the core identity of computer games. Seeing game design as a model for literacy in the 21st century, Eric Zimmerman stresses that games are essentially systemic. A game is constituted by its rules. But while John Huizinga, in his classic work Homo Ludens, stresses that you have to accept the rules to play a game, the magic circle. Um, Timmerman focuses on how play itself often challenges the rules of the game. I quote, play is far more than just play within a structure. Play can play with structures. Players do not just play games, to meta play between games and develop cultures around games. And this is part of the gaming literacy he's talking about. He claims that a literacy based on, on play is a literacy of innovation and invention. And I will accordingly argue that the aesthetics of a computer game is constituted by the very structures and systems that provide the total experience of the game. We have to look for the aesthetics of a game within its ludic qualities, not in each single element representing other aesthetic disciplines. The aesthetic 
uh, the aesthetic of games shows in the way each element together creates a systemic universe or narrative for the players to enter and play both with and within. I'm not saying that Flower is a game not being game-like enough, or that a game needs score tables and instructions to be a good game. In fact, like journalist and game theoretician Stephen Poole, I hold it to be a quite traditional game. There are, there are levels and goals to be reached, and it does require some strategies for its task. Poole finds that the only thing new with this game is its degree of sophistication uh, in its lab-based structure, claiming its idea to be adapted from older games like Okami and Res. This is only part Flower definitely explores an unknown market of gamers with other motives of playing than a strong desire to contest and solve puzzles. And that is both brave and innovative. In their book, 21st Century Game Design, Chris Bateman and Richard Boone investigate the desires of video game players according to psychological models such as the Myers-Briggs typology. They find that most computer game designers fail to identify the diversity of gamers' needs in their effort to please hardcore gamers, which they believe to play the role of evangelists introducing games to a broader market of causal gamers. Hardcore gamers are goal-oriented and enjoy conflicts in a game situation. That game company is therefore brave to produce a medita meditative game for relaxation, like Flower. But my point is still that the non-competitive basis of the game is no argument for a higher degree of artistry than in other games. And neither is it its graphic elegance. And speaking about feelings, while playing this game, I'd rather speak of falling into some kind of mood than of having actual feelings aroused. I experience a much broader spectrum of feelings being triggered playing uh, an action-oriented game like Grand Theft Auto or Medal of Honor. Working on a project plan for a doctoral degree at NTNU, I investigate the possibility for an understanding of computer games as art, facing an institutionally founded art world, where the reminiscence of modernism still craves that art and artists should be conceptual, oppositional, and non-commercial. Even though anti- and postmodern schools are dominating the art world and has done so since the 1970s, the heritage from modernism makes it difficult, if not impossible, to reenact a classical understanding of aesthetics. Computer game theorists concerned with aesthetics, aesthetic questions should therefore be careful not to exclude themselves from the debates within the art world of today. If we look for computer game aesthetics exclusively in its exterior elements like music, motion and graphics, we reduce computer game art to a question of its mimic abilities, thus subordinating it to more classic aesthetic disciplines long since disparted and renounced by modern and contemporary art. The old debate is still running though, whether formally oriented or concept-based art ought to run the future show, the conceptualists leading so far. According to the Norwegian art historian Marit Forske, conceptual artists rest on top of the hierarchy of the art world, to use Arthur Dante's term later leading to an institutionally founded, founded definition of art. To look for aesthetic expressions outside of the institutions defining art today, galleries, exhibitions and academies, for example in a more commercial area like video games, is still considered a dubious project, much thanks to two gentlemen you might know, Theodore Adorno and Max Horkheimer. Reducing every film director to a slave of the film industry and underestimating the aesthetic qualities of the film medium as a whole, the two philosophers made the first move in the direction of an institutionally enclosed art, excluding every commercial attempt to create artworks from the narrow sphere of authentic art, or should I call it fine art. As a member of Nordic Society of Aesthetics, I visited their annual conference held in Trondheim earlier this summer. The conference was titled The Future of Aesthetics. Paradoxically, only three of over four, more than 40 lectures or workshops tangled aesthetical problems concerning digital or new medial expressions. Still struggling with Andy Warhol's brilliant boxes and Arthur Danto's revival of Friedrich Hegel's end of art thesis, I realized that leading art theorists are ignoring new aesthetical problems 
connected to aesthetically oriented technology. I see the possibility of computer and video games bringing new and adequate perspectives to contemporary aesthetics, especially through the play aspects of a game, or what we call interactivity. Both modern drama and literature aim to implement the audience's response to their artwork in different ways, but their media can never reach the level of interactivity provided by computer games, especially not on online multiplayer games. Computer games give the audience the possibility to participate in and even manipulate the story of a game. And yes, most games do tell a story. From Nintendo's fairy tale inspired Legend of Zelda to urban gangster games such as Grand Theft Auto series from Rockstar North. Marie Laure Ryan shows in her book Narrative as Virtual Reality how what she calls the, po the poetics of interactivity redefined the term story. A narrative is no longer necessarily a linear work with a beginning, a middle part, and an end. Like Zimmerman, Ryan calls for, spe for special skills to create non-linear narratives. Re-enacting and revolutionizing the narrative, computer game design and technology are at the same time investigating their rather transparent systemic medium, both formally and semantically. In fact, the way contemporary artists use new technologies inside of art institution, institutions are seldom matching the competence housed by the film and computer game industry. In the introduction of his book, Video Art, from 2003, Michael Rush quotes the famous video artist William Anastasi. Is that how you pronounce it? Well, he says, I wasn't interested in video, per se. I used whatever was at my disposal to express what I was interested in. Rush claims that while some artists may identify themselves as video artists, most see video as one material amongst many to be used in their art. So video is just one of several media artists used to express their ideas, thus connecting video to the, to the area of concept art. Further, no hardy, handy themes or schools of artists present themselves as organizing tools, according to Rush. There is not the this is not the case in film and computer game industry, where all productions follow, experiment, or even deliberately break with different schools for creating narratives or for engaging a specific audience. The finest experiments and most clever formal and technological innovations are so far made on the commercial arena, suggesting that Theodore Adorno and Macron underestimate the authentic creative powers of mass media technology in their central work, Dialectic Enlightenment. My understanding of computer game aesthetics is closely connected to how I understand and define computer, game, computer games in general. Or maybe it is the opposite way around. I am in any case certain that contemporary aesthetic debates will bring themselves to a dead end without embracing the systemic interdisciplinary expressions of computer games and to identify gaming as an aesthetic experience. And video game producers have, to have a lot to gain from being aware of the aesthetic qualities of their media even to define computer and video games basically as both ludic and aesthetic expressions. Directors and film critics have fought hard for the art status of film narratives. Now computer game designers and critics will have to fight the same fight to convince the art world that their medium is, has, authentic, has authentic aesthetic qualities. Ludologist and computer game researcher Lars Konzak claims that the challenge of game designers now is to get, design games that go beyond mere entertainment. I quote, even if a game designer does not intentionally control or design the philo philosophy behind the game, one will exist anyway, just as in film. In a well-designed philosophical game, the philosophy of the game is a co coherent thought system or even a number of thought systems that interact in conflicting patterns. Konzak advises designers to think not in terms of this feature would be cool to have, but rather this mechanical feature supports the philosophy of the game. I hold that several game designers already, already think like this, or else a complex sandbox game like, like GTA San Andreas would not work as well as it does. It challenges its gamers, both technically and philosophically, by the choices given by the by the brutalism of its anti-hero Carl Johnson, 
and the merciless and satirically USA-influenced world of gang gangsters. Creators like Dan Hauser, the man behind some of the GTA productions, thus prove that you can, can go beyond the aspect of entertainment without dismissing it. Then back to the question I started with. Is the game flower bringing computer games closer to art? I'd say yes to a certain degree. Not because its graphics, which I find rather dull, uh, are more beautiful than other games' graphics, nor because the story is kind of abstract, and definitely not because it arouses the game's feelings, but because it simplifies and sophisticates the, t the traditional game structure, thereby challenging creators to find and develop new solutions to guidelines for us gamers. Even if, if Flower is not my kind of game, I do admit that interacting with sounds and figures rather than reading instructions is a path worth exploring for most game designers, as long as it doesn't reduce the flexibility of a game system. My final answer will be that Flower may not bring computer games closer to art in itself, but it enhances the aesthetic character, character of this medium in general. There's one. In the whole series of each chapter, yep. it certainly has overtones of all that you're talking about, like in text, like in the Moralia, in the essays, and especially in the series, he's very open to the idea that you know, kind of pitch to audience and produce good content. And additionally, that what is traditionally considered um, high art objects always can incorporate some kind of pitch into them. So I guess what I'm saying is that um, don't Yes, I know, and, and this is kind of um, uh, something I did to, to point my, um, or to, to make my points very clear, but I, I do know that I can use, I don't know, um, uh, in different ways. I know that he has done some uh, writings on how to compose for films and, and stuff, so, so I know that he's not, I know that it's together with Horkheimer. <laughs> uh, I can, yeah, but I, I'll take it with me. But in cultural industry, they, um, they um, say that uh, the separation of, uh, or the, that mass media technology uh, uh, puts fine and, or higher and lower uh, culture together, and both of them are, are um, losing uh, important aspects uh, in this. So I, I think it is possible to, uh, if you read them uh, a little bit uh, harsh, to, to well, yeah. Well, yes, I <coughs> want to say as well I'm sympathetic for the project of aesthetics of computer games. I was, I was wondering, it involves this project of, I guess, inventing a whole new vocabulary to address the features of computer games in terms of aesthetics. And there is the, the tradition of game criticism or practice by popular media as computer game magazines, that kind of stuff. Do you see any potential linkage between those two different endeavors, as in game criticism? Yes, of course. Um, uh, that's why also um, I'll have to separate this type from the, what the project I'm working on. But um, uh, of course, it, the uh, critics and, and the producers of video games should engage themselves in in the more theoretical uh, discussions, of course. Oh, yeah, and, and that, that will sort of aiming at that because uh, and that will come if yes, but uh, uh, but huh? <laughs> I'm, I was aiming at that. That we should then engage the game critics in this, in this, like you were in this more theoretical discussion. Yeah. Because there, there was a debate about. But we'll have to start. <laughs> yeah, I, I agree. Yeah. Um, as a game developer, I'd like to, uh, I have to uh, admit that uh, commercial interests have to take uh, first place. Um, you mentioned uh, play, this is 
what uh, for a cloud like Sumo, uh, sometimes create these visions like I mean if uh, you want to get ahead of the times you should have I think we'll have to, theoreticians have to uh, uh, accept the field of, uh, ha have to take the, um, the field of computer games seriously. And um, so, so we'll have to start if, of course, th these are, are already uh, going on, the debates, but they are um, on a very low level. And that's because um, uh, theoreticians have been uh, afraid to uh, embrace this field. So. Maybe we'll have to start, but, but it, it's all, it's of course, it will develop over time. Mm -hmm. Two more questions. Yeah, yes. and it might find out why in the art world this does not become fine art, this parts ahead and you know part part is important. Yes, but still it continues. It's it's not all well, well it's still going on to a certain degree, yes. And and that's why I'm I'm going I'm going to um uh, find support in uh, a, a Norwegian a professor of aesthetics up in Berwick who's been writing on this and he's um, He's written a book called uh, uh, Modernism, Anti-Modernism, Post-Modernism, where he um, uh, tries to find the authenticity of post-modern art. Um, and he finds that post-modern art, which is not anti-modernistic, um, uh, succeed in, in, um, in, in producing uh, authentic art because, because they still uh, have some um, distance to their material, because it, it uh, okay, <laughs> I wasn't planning on talk, speaking about this. Um, it takes more like a kind of phenomenological perspective. Yeah, he, yeah, 